Good afternoon from Strasbourg to all of you joining us from Europe and other parts of the world. I'm Susanne Nikolchev, the Executive Director of the European Audiovisual Observatory, which I'm proud to say celebrates this year its 30th anniversary. And it is in this context my pleasure to welcome you to this conference on the Media Freedom Act and Public Service Media, the first public event during our anniversary year. Public service media play an essential role for the right to freedom of expression and information, a role that is also of great importance for media pluralism and, as the pandemic has shown, for obtaining reliable information in times of crisis. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that the Council of Europe has consistently stressed the vital role of public service media in its standard setting work. As I'm leading the partial agreement of the Council of Europe, which, among others, observes the audiovisual market in Europe, I like to tell you that public service media are also an essential component of the European audiovisual industry. Just consider that public funding accounts for about one quarter of the sector's total revenues and that five of the 13 European companies, which rank in the top 50 worldwide leading audiovisual groups, are public service media. Also, in Europe, public service media account for roughly 20-80% of television viewing, and they are the largest commissioners of high-end TV fiction. But this strong position should possibly not be taken for granted especially in light of the slow erosion of the funding of public service media, which contrasts with the current financial needs to further modernize them and to make them attractive for viewers in an on-demand world. Public service media are also challenged by the consolidation and vertical integration of its private competitors, a move that might be strengthening the private sector, but remains impossible for, for public service media due to their very statute. All in all, that means that the public service media are facing a number of structural challenges, such as securing the right level of independence from those holding economic and political power and securing appropriate funding, but also adapting to the digital age and maintaining high editorial standards in a competitive market. In the past months, the European Audiovisual Observatory has focused on PSM governance in Europe as part of its regular program of activities. And as a result, we just released an overview of the most critical areas for safeguarding their independence on a European level. The report titled Governance and Independent of Pu Independence of Public Service Media also analyzes various countries with different regulatory traditions. For each country, it explains the structure of the national public service media, its legal form, its managerial and supervisory structure, how key appointments are made, and what safeguards against undue dismissals exist, and how the independence of public service media is protecting from political interference. Now, this report is accompanied by a search tool informing about the governance of public service media in the EU 27 member states, the four EFTA countries, the UK, and we are actually working on expanding it to finally cover all of the 41 member states of the observatory. We believe that having compiled this information and having made it publicly available on our website will facilitate the general discussions on the European Media Act announced by the European Commission, where public service media will certainly feature. And it, in this context, it's an honor that the European Commission's Vice President for Values and Transparency, Vera Jourova, has accepted our invitation and addresses us now with a keynote. Let's watch her video message. Dear Mrs. Nikolchev, ladies and gentlemen, 
First of all, I would like to thank the European Audiovisual Observatory for organizing this event and for inviting me. The discussions that you will have today are very important and timely. The European Commission is indeed preparing and consulting widely on the future Media Freedom Act. This legislative initiative is unprecedented. For the first time, we will set out in EU law safeguards to protect media freedom and pluralism. We will protect independent and plural media as an essential pillar of our democracies, as the watchdogs of democracies. We need to act because we have seen attempts across the EU by state authorities and by private actors to put pressure on journalists and media outlets. Public service media are not immune to those threats. On the contrary, some politicians would like to turn public service media into party media. They would like to use the media to serve their own interests and opinions. And if the public service media don't do that, then, according to their views, public service media should not exist. They should not receive public funding. Well, this is not how democracies work. In democracies, public service media serve the public interest. They give access to information and culture for all. Their journalists should be able to work freely and do so according to the highest professional standards. Public service media should help people play their role as citizens. This is why they deserve and should get sustainable public funding without strings attached. During the pandemic, we have seen public service media broadcasting more educational content to support children and their parents confined at home. This is just one example highlighting the role of public service media as a cement of society. This role is even more important in these times of online bubbles. People are more and more exposed to the same opinions and to disinformation online. We need to make sure that every citizen can have access to independent public service media, providing facts and a diversity of views. So how can we do that? This will be part of our discussion today. The Media Freedom Act should reflect on how to strengthen the governance of public service media to counter the risks posed, in particular, by politicization. There should be safeguards to prevent against arbitrary dismissals of management, which does not suit for politically motivated reasons. The Commission is aware that this issue remains sensitive for the Member States. We are also aware of the Amsterdam Protocol, but I am sure that we can and we should find common ground in the interest of the Union and of all Europeans. Let me be very clear, we want to preserve systems which are working. We actually need to get inspiration from them. This is why the data provided by the observatory, the expertise and experience of regulators and stakeholders here today is so important. There are national systems and rules which can help define European standards and even further, maybe global standards. Together, I am sure that we can define the right approach to ensure that public service media can fully play their role in our societies and democracies in the interest of all Europeans. And I fully rely on your support. Thank you. Many thanks to Vice President Jurova. It shows that the online world in which we have now been living for so long has also a good side so that we could bring her in with this very uh, concrete address. 
I noted that the Commissioner stressed the goal of the Media Freedom Act to strengthen the governance of public service media, which means that the research done by the Observatory on the current legal framework for this very topic should indeed be helpful. And that's exactly, of course, what we want to achieve. Now, we will, um, the discussions now will um, go into um, three various areas that uh, we uh, that go beyond the current legal framework and they will also explore the future of public service media and we will thereby not only go into legal aspect, um, aspects but we will also look into market issues and this not least because it is the specialty of the observatory to look at topics from these two sides. Now, more concretely, we will deal with three questions. The first is, what is the weight of public service media in terms of audience, revenues, funding, and original production? The second, how to best ensure the editorial independence of public service media? And then, um, what is the impact of the online revolution on the role of public service media in Europe? Now, each topic will be addressed in a specific panel with the help of our distinguished guests. And I'm very happy um, to thereby uh, also welcome them. And you can see them on the screen we have with us. Patrick Pennings, who is Head of Information Society Department at the Council of Europe. Actually, he's now unfortunately the only one that you might not be able to see on the screen, but I think this will come shortly. Uh, we have with us Karim Iburki, Chair of ERGA and President of the Belgian Regulator CSA. And I see Patrick has also arrived on the screen. We have um, also joining us Renate Schroeder, Director of the European Federation of Journalists, Richard Burnley, Director of Legal and Policy from the European Broadcasting Union, Milan Mitev, Director General of the Bulgarian National Radio, and Olaf Nihus, Director Legal and Policy of the Norwegian Public Broadcaster. Now, this discussion will be moderated by two dear colleagues of mine, the heads of department of the observatory. On the one hand, we have Gilles Fontaine, who is responsible for the market team, and Maya Capello, um, who is responsible for the legal team. Now, during all these sessions, you are welcome to ask questions and make comments. Um, as audience, you will find the chat box and also the Q&A function on the toolbar on the right hand of your screen. Uh, feel not limited to wait for the Q&A session. You can contact us at any time and we will pick up uh, comments and questions as they fit. And with this, I'm very happy to leave the floor now to Gilles Fontaine. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Good afternoon to all. Um, um, the point of this first session is to focus on the situation of public service media from an economic standpoint. Uh, it's a huge subject, so I, I would like to focus the discussion on two key words. The one is funding, <clears throat> and by funding I mean, of course, the level of funding of PSMs. And the second one is competition, because of course PSMs are not isolated for the rest, from the rest of the audiovisual industry. So we will start right away by addressing the funding question. And to kickstart the discussion, let me just share one slide <clears throat> with some figures. What the figures uh, suggest is that, first, globally speaking, and on average in Europe, there is a stagnation of the public service media's revenue. And you can see that it's even a, a decrease in real terms, meaning if you discount inflation. So that's my first take when I look at the figures. The second one is the huge disparity between uh, public service medias in Europe. Um, on average, they get 28% of the audience, but it ranges from more than 70% to less than 10%. Huge disparity also in terms of revenues per in inhabitant, again, ranging for more than 100 euros per year to less than 10 euros per year. What the figure suggests also is that there is 
a correlation between the level of funding and the audience share on the market. So looking at the figures bring me uh, quite naturally to uh, a series of questions regarding the uh, level of funding of the uh, PSMs in Europe. And um, in that context, uh, we can go back to the panel and my first question will go to um, Olaf Nius. Um, PSMs in Scandinavia are often presented as uh, models, uh, uh, models in terms of strong audiences, models in terms of high level of funding. So I have quite um, a, a straightforward question for you, uh, Olaf. Is uh, the NRK well funded and to, to which extent is this funding secured? You, you should unmute yourself. Ah. Yeah. Hmm. But I am unmuted. It's, it's okay now. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, Jill, thank you so much. And let me very briefly, as a start, thank you so much for the, the uh, European uh, Audiovisual Observatory for arranging this conference, which is focusing on such important topics and for inviting me. Then, turning to your concrete question, NRK is not in a financial crisis. Having said that, of course, we could have done more with more money, more resources. But the most important part for NRK was the amending of the funding model, which, which took place three years ago. So, by that time, they changed it from a license fee, license fee system based on levy on TV sets to a state budget funding. We were concerned about this. We were concerned about it because of the independence. So when we worked on a new financing model, we said there should be three prerequisites, uh, three uh, prerequisites for, for the new model. First of all, the new model should secure the independence. Then secondly, it must be sustainable for a long time period. Thirdly, the model must be perceived by the society as fair and reasonable. This implies you need a broad political support for the model to make it stable over time and secure the conditions. Finally, the, the, the model we ended up with implies that the parliament is uh, fixing the budget over the state budget every year, but it's fixed for four years term. That is a very important point, to avoid yearly debate on the funding. However, the first challenge for us will be next year, or, or this autumn in fact, when they decide for the second four times period. So the system is still a bit fragile in my opinion. We need to look for other measures to secure the independence. Thanks a lot, uh, Olaf. Um, I, I will have a, a, a similar question to, to Milan Mitev, even, of course, in a very different um, context. Um, in contrast with uh, Scandinavia, the situation seems sometimes less, let's say, favorable uh, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. So here is my, again, straightforward uh, question to you, uh, uh, Milan. Uh, do you have a funding issue? Hello, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, take part in this conference. Uh, definitely, uh, the point of view from Eastern Europe is quite different from that in the Scandinavian countries. Traditionally, public service media in this region have been underfunded and uh, find it very hard to operate, find it very hard to develop. And this development is very important right now because there is a transition happening from traditional broadcasting to uh, multimedia content to online content. Uh, I think it's very important for public service media to place uh, not only to uh, promote independent journalism, but also to do it online in order to find this, to find this information, because it's in the social media and in the internet space where this information most often happens. 
And that is why it's important that public service media have prominent online services and bring their traditional values to uh, every possible platform which distributes journalistic content. And this sort of development, it needs funding. That is why there really is a necessity for a sustainable funding model, a predictable funding model, uh, because, for example, uh, although we, of course, have multi uh, annual uh, plans, uh, in practice, uh, uh, the budget uh, for public service media in Bulgaria, as in many other countries, is voted every year, which makes it uh, very hard to plan for the time, for the time ahead and uh, makes it difficult to do uh, mid-term and long-term planning. And this is essential for the development of our services into the future. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Milen. Um, I would like now to, to turn to uh, uh, Karimi Burki, and uh, in particular uh, as regards his capacity uh, as chair of the, of the ERGA. Uh, as far as I'm, I know, but I may be, may be wrong, <clears throat> The, the regulators are not in charge of defining the level of funding of public service, but still, uh, my question is, is that issue on your radar, uh, is it a topic of concern uh, for the regulators? Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, and uh, uh, again, a great congratulations to you guys, because uh, all the publication of the observ observatory are really key to uh, a better understanding of our, of our media and uh, uh, our topic uh, uh, of discussion today. So, uh, what I would like to say, of course, uh, I mean, uh, uh, financial independence of, of public service media is key in a democracy. So you cannot uh, go around it. And of course, it's on our radar because as a regulator, we are also in charge of an assuring the independence of the media sector from any uh, influence or outside influence. The uh, editorial uh, freedom of public service media is close to our heart and it is in our remit. So uh, it is closely linked, of course, to the means that the public service media will have at their disposal, especially now in this very competitive world, when uh, we see, as uh, uh, it has been said in the introduction, that we see a consolidation of private actors uh, in Europe. And when we look at the, con at the competition that all the public service media face, uh, with the platform that have emerged over the past uh, the past years, so uh, in the uh, public funding and uh, appropriate, uh, if I can say so, level of funding uh, is key. And as Olaf said, also a clear sight on the future of the funding, which also guarantees the independence of the media, is clearly key and is uh, uh, one of the uh, focus of our attention that we will have, uh, that we have always have, and that we will continue to have in the future, especially in this competitive world. Keep on going around the virtual table by uh, um, now asking a question to, to Richard Burnley. Um, we have heard, mm -hmm. and I guess uh, it's not a full surprise, mm -hmm. that there is an ongoing transition to the online world meaning uh, the need for strong investments uh, to set up online services uh, or to reach the young audiences. W when I go back to the global uh, figures I was referring to before, um, it seemed that they show that at the same time there is a level of pressure on the PSB's um, uh, revenues. Uh, and maybe even uh, I could say that some of them are at the risk of being marginalized. So, um, huge need of investment in the future, pressure on the, on the PSMs, uh, funding, is there a way to solve the equation? Thank you so much, Gilles, and um, thank you so much to the Observatory for, for holding this important event and also wishing the Observatory a very happy birthday. Um, yes, I mean, to give you, it's, it's, it's always nice to have our own members here who can talk very eloquently for themselves. I, I can give you a, a more pan-European um, 
perspective and global perspective, in fact. Um, the total revenues, as, as, as you've touched on, Gio, of PSM, approximately 36 billion euros, um, and the total revenues of just the top 10 tech uh, companies are more like 900 plus billion. Um, so that's 30 times already and growing, and that's a divergency that's growing every day. Um, you know, public service media did, did well during the COVID, um, no doubt about that. There was a thirst for good quality content, there was a thirst for objective news. But the real winners were indeed the streaming and the tech giants, let's be honest. Um, and yet what we see as a sector, and, and speaking for, for, for our members as a whole, is that there is still a huge hunger in Europe for locally produced European content. Um, now, we should, we should um, mark that, that public service media is producing about four times, according to us, it's about four times more origin, original content than the globals. It's about 85% of their output, and that's um, about 18 billion euros invested in, in original European content. So indeed, um, as you highlight, the main question is how to protect European content in the future, how to protect um, European values, and ultimately how to protect European media industry and, and European jobs. Um, and, and I think to do that, as, as I think has been touched on by, by the whole panel so far, yes, we need stable, independent funding of public service media. Yes, we also need smart, effective regulation. And, and, and the time for that is now, and we call on governments and regulators to do just that. And we look forward to working through with the Media Freedom Act as well, and to see what safeguards we can we can um, build on to 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 ensure um, public service media has adequate and independent funding structures, but also a smart and effective regulatory environment to 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 protect it for the future. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Richard. Um, uh, several of you uh, alluded to um, a, a changing world, to consolidation of pri private players, to vertical integration, and that's precisely the second key word I would like to, to address in, the, in that panel, uh, com competition. W what I wanted to show regarding competition is, is pretty straightforward. Um, there are signs of consolidation, and vertical integration regarding, let's say, uh, broadcasters, private broadcasters, and um, and distributors of, of audiovisual services. Um, there is also signs of uh, um, consolidation at the production level, uh, be it for um, what I would call flow uh, programs, um, game shows, and so on, be it for, uh, for TV fiction. And this consolidation is driven, on the one hand, uh, by uh, um, uh, private groups. Oh, here are the slide. Um, private production groups, let's call them independent production groups, but also for, by subsidiaries of uh, private broadcasters, namely competitors to an extent to, um, to the public broadcasters. So ongoing consolidation at the service level, I would say, and at the production level. So my general question is going to be whether this is of any concern uh, for, the, for the PSMs, but I will be uh, more specific and, and start, by, uh, again, start again by a question to, to Olaf. Um, I have done some uh, homework, and I've seen that last year, um, Telenor, the telecom operator, and Nant uh, merged their pay TV distribution activity, which are uh, available all across Scandinavia, but of course uh, in, in Norway. I've seen that um, Fremantle, the subsidiary of Vertel Group, has acquired several North version compa production companies for Nant. So my question is, are these moves among the private sector a concern or a challenge to NRK? Uh, thank you, Jill. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course, the, the consolidation and vertical integration is of concern for us. But I would say that it relates to two aspects. It's both relate to content and to publishing. Of course, the market 
has been much tougher when it comes to achieving rights for sports, premium content, and so on. So that is one aspect. The other, and just as important, is the publishing aspect. How to reach direct out to the audience. How to be a relevant player in this, this growing market. So our, uh, our uh, strategy and challenge is to build up our own platform, develop that to get the audience, uh, give the audience access directly to the NRK without moving into third parties platforms. That is important, both for independence, editorial control, and to, to secure the, that the audience get access to the public service media content. So, so but it's, it's a challenge, but the competition in itself is not something new. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will now um, go to, to, to Milen. Um, uh, again, uh, doing some very uh, simple homework. I have seen that in, uh, in Bulgaria, um, PPF Group, uh, which is also active in several countries, uh, uh, also happens to be a, a powerful mobile telecommunication op op operator. So I'm, I'm just stressing that to say that uh, also in Bulgaria, as in many countries, this consolidation process is, is, uh, is, is happening. And therefore, uh, same question to you. Um, are these moves uh, uh, relevant uh, to, to, to BNR? Are there... Uh, a topic of attention or even a concern or a challenge for you? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, to be honest, uh, uh, right now in Bulgaria, two of uh, the most popular television channels are owned by owners that also own telecom companies. Luckily, so far this hasn't been an issue, but these integrations only happened in the recent years, so we still don't know what they will mean for the future. Uh, of course, uh, having such integrated companies uh, means that it's much easier for them to distribute their own content. Again, so far, at least on a national level, we still haven't seen uh, any real issues with that. Uh, but of course, uh, this means that public service media are in a weaker position because we don't have the buying power of the big tech giants and uh, we, will, uh, we are less able to uh, develop our own platforms because we don't have uh, the necessary resources. And uh, in this respect, uh, I think that probably uh, it would be useful for public service media if we can help each other on the technical side of things, because the issue with co cooperation between PSM is usually uh, mainly due to the fact that all public media have uh, their public mission defined on a national level. So it's specific for the, for the uh, relevant state. But that doesn't mean that we cannot cooperate and collaborate on uh, different technological measures in order to improve our offerings to the public and become stronger. Thanks a lot, Milen. Uh, <clears throat> um, Karim, you mentioned uh, yourself consolidation uh, in, in, the preview, in, in the first round of the, of the discussion. Um, <clears throat> Do, do, do you believe that it's uh, possible for PSMs uh, to uh, stay apart uh, from this uh, consolidation process? Uh, Suzanne Nikolchev, in her introduction, mentioned the fact that, uh, <clears throat> of course, there are statutory limits. Still, um, yes, is there a specific answer, uh, maybe with the help of regulators, uh, to this ongoing consolidation of, of, of the sector? Well, uh, we, we don't see consolidation per se as, as a bad move, uh, especially when it, ha when it happens in Europe. I mean, uh, we should be happy in a way that uh, big European groups are consolidating to face non-European uh, economic groups. So per se, there is, there is not a problem with this concentration. The problem lies in uh, for the PSM to uh, have the means to still exist in tomorrow's world. That is that is the, the key question. And 
uh, it's funny because this morning, this very morning, we, I, I was in, we were in a discussion at the CSA, so the Belgian regulator, with Jean-Paul Philippot, a well-known figure among the, the, the uh, public broadcaster, because we are in the midst of the discussion of the next contract for the RTBF, the public, uh, the public broadcaster. And uh, there was a question one, uh, from one of the members of the, the regulator body. Uh, so what's the, is it possible to help uh, public service media to go deeper into cooperation? And he says that was a big concern because this, it seems that this topic has been on the forefront of uh, a lot of discussion, but not really happening. So uh, I think that uh, in this topic, maybe European Union could be a key player in helping, maybe technically as well, for all the public media to share common technical specificities. There are success stories of European cooperation. When you look at TV5, when you look at Arte, those are success stories of uh, uh, European cooperation. So is Arte the next European platform? I don't know. But surely there are means to uh, let us say, reduce the cost, especially on the technical point of view, if public service media are allowed, encouraged, funded to uh, work together to uh, face the huge challenge that we have been talking about uh, previously. Thanks, thanks Karim. Uh, Richard, um, uh, both Karim and, and Milan, uh, alluded to a form, or not alluded, explained that form of cooperation have, are possible in terms of uh, technology investment. Uh, I would like to ask you more about um, collaboration in terms of production of content. Uh, as I was saying before, there is the surge of big production groups, uh, either independent uh, or either uh, affiliates to, pri to private broadcasters. So my question is, if it's a threat to public service uh, broadcasters and uh, is more cooperation in the terms of programming, in the terms of production uh, between the members in the mind of the EBU's members? Th thank you, Karim. Um, indeed, um, I think it's well documented now what, what we're, we're facing is a, is, is a revolution the like we've never seen before. Um, and we have fully diversified global competitors vertically integrated top to bottom, potentially controlling the, the outlet and the gateways and the platforms um, and being able to decide what stays up and, and, and comes down. And, and I think fr from my perspective and from our perspective, that's the crucial issue here. Um, however, how do you how do you maintain public service media? How do you maintain the European um, audiovisual ecosystem? Well, certainly, co-production co cooperation um, will be key, and I think and, and that goes to technology as well as production. And we have um, a number of co-productions that go on among our members. We also have regional co-productions, particularly in the Nordic region, for example, um, which maybe Olaf could expand on there. But, um, and, and of course, there are also rights and copyright issues, so, so, so sometimes it's not as easy as it, as it seems. Um, I mean, I think from, from, from our perspective broadly, as I say, what's going on in the markets now is, is a huge risk to European freedoms and values. And, um, and I think, Touching on, on, on the topic of Media Freedom Act as well for today, I th yes, the health and sustainability of the European media system and ecosystem is, is hugely important and we need to sort our own houses out as best we can and make sure that everything's running, run, running as optimally as possible. But we do need to also not forget the bigger picture and, and to ensure, yes, um, public service media is up to date, sustainable, properly funded, and, um, and it has a remit to be able to adapt in the future and to, to, to enter into such co-production and cooperation agreements, as you say, public, private, um, European public media with, with European private media. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, Olaf, there, was a, there is a question in the chat box about how to achieve 
uh, good pan-European co-productions. If I remember correctly, the success of the so-called Nordic Noir uh, TV series started a long time ago by a coordinated effort uh, between the Scandinavian uh, PSMs. Is, is that correct? Uh, and um, can, can you expand a little bit on that, uh, on that success story? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Jill. Uh, uh, it started with, uh, as we call, the North Vision, which is a partnership between the Nordic public service media companies. Mm -hmm. Yearly, we exchange 4,500 programs of all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, programs. Then, when we moved to the last, uh, last thing we did, we agreed upon uh, exchanging and producing 12 common drama series a year which we call the Nordic 12, which will be made available in all the Nordic countries on the TV players and broadcast it. And if you allow me, Jill, because I think we are touching upon something which is very crucial and important. One thing is the quality of the content. Another question, which is just as important in my mind, is the restrictions on publishing, because if you have the best quality, the best drama in the world, it doesn't help you if it's just available for a very limited period. So what we've seen is that Netflix and the other big global players, they are there with the content. The, the people uh, impression is that this is available for eternity, but the public service content is just there for a blink of a second, they think. And in some countries, there's a restriction on the length for how long you can have the public service content available. That's a very important and dangerous restriction in my point of view. So, so, so just you have to see these, these two aspects together, both producing high quality content and then securing that it's available for the audience over years over a long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Th thanks a lot. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the chat box, but I'm seeing that uh, the questions so far, except the one uh, about co-production, rather relate to uh, governance issue and, uh, and go beyond the pure funding. So I, I, I will uh, uh, transfer them to my colleague, uh, Maya Capello. Um, thanks a lot, really, to all our panelists for this uh, for this insight. I think that in 30 minutes we got a pretty good view of the challenges, successes. So it's time now to close this first session, and um, I will therefore leave the floor now to my uh, colleague Maya. Thank you very much, Gilles, and I enjoyed very much the, the panel from the other side of the studio, and I'm very happy to have the privilege to take over now to uh, dive into uh, the legal issues. We will have uh, still two panels ahead, and we will look both at the present and at the future, but to uh, have a little stimulation for our discussion, I would suggest that we start with a little video snapshot prepared by uh, the observatory. We have uh, senior legal analyst Francisco Cabrera who has uh, put together some uh, dualities for uh, your common reflection and then we will come back to the studio right after the video. Enjoy. <laughs> Human beings tend to see and reproduce dualities everywhere they go. Body and soul, yin and yang, yes and no. Even computers function on the basis of ones and zeros. And you may say there is the duality of commercial and public service broadcasting. I would like to talk, however, about another duality that matters particularly for our discussion today. Theory and practice. You know what they say, there is no difference between theory and practice in theory. In the case at hand, that is, the independence of public service media, there is also theory and practice. The theory are the legal norms that aim at protecting the independence of public service media. If you allow me a bit of Latin, let's call it the jure independence. The practice, or de facto independence, 
would be public service media actually carrying out their activities independently from the powers that be. Let's start with the theory. At the European level, the Council of Europe has established standards through different legal instruments of the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly and through judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Nevertheless, public service media is in most cases national and accordingly they are regulated at national level. This has as a consequence a great diversity of national models. There are richer and poorer public service media and while some have a long tradition of independence from the state, some others have less. There is also differences in terms of how the public service media are built, how they are funded, what their remit is and how their governance works. Depending on how all these issues are handled by law, they can contribute or be an obstacle to the independence of public service media. Regarding this last issue I mentioned, governance, the European Audiovisual Observatory has just released a publication that you can now see on the screen. The publication focuses on the governance of public service media and the role that it plays in securing the right level of independence from the state. It provides an analysis of a selection of countries covering all four cardinal directions in Europe, which display different regulatory traditions. It explains for each country the structure of the National Public Service Broadcaster, its legal form, its managerial and supervisory structure, the way key appointments are made, the safeguards concerning dismissals, and the ways in which the independence of the public service media is protected from political interference. Moving on to de facto independence, you may be wondering, why is theory and practice not the same in practice? As explained by the EBU in its report on governance principles for public service media, independence may be influenced by a variety of other factors, such as political and social structures, political and corporate culture, and interaction among stakeholders at a particular time. Even an optimum legal framework and organizational structure may fail to produce the desired outcome if the corporate climate, the political culture or the behavior of the main actors does not support the independence of public service media. As I mentioned before, our publication does not provide a description of how independent those public service media de facto are. Performing this type of analysis would require that we evaluate the activities of each public service media, which goes beyond what the statute of the observatory allows. If you are interested in such an evaluation, you may find it, for example, in the European Commission's Rule of Law Reports and the Media Pluralism Monitor of the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom. Now, I started this little presentation talking about dualities, didn't I? Well, I have another one in stock. The thing is, it is not difficult to find criticisms of partiality and bias concerning many, if not all, public service media in Europe. Just do a bit of research on the internet and you'll see. So, how do you measure the part of objectivity and the part of subjectivity in those criticisms? I will leave this thorny matter for the panel to discuss, but concerning the objectivity-subjectivity duality, let me just throw a thought on the table. For those who cannot read ancient Greek, me included, this is the source of a well-known dictum. Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. So, paraphrasing, here is my question to you. Must public service media be above suspicion? Or is this an impossible standard to meet and there will always be someone to find fault at whatever public service media do? I leave you with this question. Thanks for your attention. Well, we have about Caesar's wife uh, having to live above suspicion. So now the question is, does this apply also to public service media? Should they live up to the same standard? And if yes, how do we ensure their editorial independence? This is what we're going to discuss in this panel number two, editorial independence of public service media. And uh, with the help of uh, our four distinguished panelists, we will uh, now dive into various aspects. Um, I would like to start with Patrick Pennings, because the work of the 
Council of Europe in this field has been extensive over time. You started many decades ago, and uh, there are certainly some highlights that our audience should uh, not miss. And maybe also something for the European Commission to learn, since uh, the Council of Europe has already done quite a lot in this field. So uh, what could be learned from the experience of the Council of Europe with regard to independence of public service media, Patrick? The screen is yours. Thank you, dear Maya. And of course, I wouldn't want to cast any suspicion on Caesar's wife. Um, I think uh, it's also more a question of trust. It's not only a question of suspicion, but a question of trust. And I think that's also important, an important duality that is trust and distrust in today's world uh, with regards to the role of the public service media. Commit, uh, the Council of Europe and the Committee of Ministers has, of course, regularly uh, referred uh, to the independence of, of the public service media and has identified three key elements there. Editorial independence uh, in order to uh, make sure that there is credibility for this public watchdog fun function, a favorable re regulatory environment, stable and sustainable funding, and merit-based appointments based on a bipartisan uh, appointment procedure. Uh, we have gone further than that. I mean, the Committee of Ministers has, in the past two decades, launched something like eight different Committee of Ministers recommendations on top of the Parliamentary Assembly uh, resolutions and the conferences that we've been holding over those past years. Um, I think I can list a couple of elements that would influence that independence. That is the transparency and inclusiveness of the procedure. The merit-based criteria and procedures, they have to be balanced. The professionalism and the clear mandate of public service media supervisory bodies. Pooling off periods for former politicians to be involved. The transparency of the media ownership. Many elements have been discussed in the previous panels. Also, the accountability of public service media and sustainable funding. I think the Brussels Declaration clearly pointed to standing up for the independence of public service media. And that independence has to be typified. And using the criteria I just listed, this may be helpful. Thank you. These principles, they sound uh, as actual as they ever could be, so I'm sure they will uh, have a long life. That's also the advantage of general principles. They, uh, they get old very, uh, very difficultly. So uh, that, that I, is also probably the secret to uh, their success. But uh, rules, uh, they have a life, of course. Uh, one thing is the theory and one thing is practice. And not always do they really match. So I would like now to do a little reality check with the help of Renate Schröder from the uh, European Federation of Journalists, of which uh, Renate is director. So from your experience, which is, of course, uh, the one from the newsroom, the one from those working on the field, those who are ensuring that uh, we can trust public service media, um, what is your feeling in, in this regard? Is there a, a sort of match between theory and practice? Do you, do you identify some difficulties for public service media with regards to the respect of these principles, Renate? The screen is yours. Thank you all. You should un... Yes, do you hear me? All good. Okay, <laughs> it's always like that. Well, I was just th saying thank you, Maya. Thank you very much for the European Federation of Journalists being invited to this very important uh, meeting today. And indeed, there is theory and practice. And um, a bit has been said already this morning or this afternoon by the commissioner. But I just would like to set the scene at the beginning, saying that in recent years, as you all know, there has been an unprecedented number of threats to the physical and online safety of journalists working for public service media, and both coming from state actors, but also from radicalized groups from within society, still small but loud, both enough and in common with the media hostility. 
According to the Media Pluralism Monitor 2021, the independence is at risk in 15 countries of the 32 covered, which is up to uh, 12 from 2020, so three more. And I think um, this does not only refer to the new member states, to the usual suspects, it includes also countries like, I can say, recent attempts to the RAF on, on its independence, on its funding, uh, recent attempts, long attempts on Slovenia, for example. So it is, and here I'm coming to respond to your question, it is the culture of political influence very much combined with constant economic pressures, which puts again and again this independence at high risk. Even with most of PSMs having editorial guidelines or ethical codes, they are very often purely implemented or observed in practice. We know most of the new member states often have the best codes copied, but the reality, unfortunately, it's different. Editorial principles will only protect and fulfill its mission when known to the journalist, when implemented accordingly, and, and I think this is very important, when the will by PSM management persists to get it widely recognized. So such political will must be guided, and I think by EU legislation, which I refer to in a moment, and endorsed by the EBU family without any compromises. In fact, only the Council of Europe has repeatedly warned of the unsatisfactory transformation of the former state broadcasters, but also the binding independence of the public service media in Western Europe. Populists, assaults on public service media, we all know it, therefore hit a system that is already on the defensive. So this rings alarm bells also for the media in general, as according to a Reuters study, where there is good PSM, there is in general more trust. Very important term just used by Patrick. With growing media politicization, there is naturally no trust. That's why we fully support within the framework of the EMFA on ensuring editorial freedom the following points, and I just mentioned four. The rules on the absence of conflict of interest for PSM management is important. I only say Berlusconi, and I think we know it all. Independent safeguards for the appointment and dismissal procedures regarding PSM management has already said, but cannot be said often enough. Of course, rules on fair and diverse societal representation and management, I think today is ever more important. But also, and I think that's important, even though that may be soft law, regular dialogue between management and editorial boards on guarantees of independence for its editorial work. It is crucial that editorial content is led and protected by the program directors and not by the supervisory boards. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Renate. It's, uh, it's indeed a scattered picture that has many grey shades huh, from what you uh, have depicted right now. Uh, so uh, no reason to be totally optimistic yet, but let's see if the, the way forward can bring, some, uh, can bring some light and let's see if uh, some more institutions can be uh, brought on board. And now I am looking at Karimi Burki, chair of ERGA this year and president of the Belgian Media Regulator. CSA. Now, it looks like uh, also in the European Union there will be uh, new functions to come. Uh, what about the regulators? Uh, is there a role here that you can play? Uh, this has notably uh, been a field where member states have always acted, let's say, quite autonomously without any harmonization. And now it uh, looks like things might change, which might lead also to uh, a new role for you. So uh, what's your view on this and are you ready to do your part, Karim? The screen is yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maya. First of all, I would like to, to stress that I fully support what just uh, Renat just said. Uh, I think that uh, when, when you look at the, uh, the URA corpus that we all have in Europe and which are guaranteed by the fundamental text that, uh, that have been mentioned, uh, actually fair and transparent and uh, independent PSM are, are guaranteed. And indeed, there needs to be independent studies like yours, like others, uh, to, to tell us if the reality checks 
Uh, and so this is this is there are a few things that are, that have that have been said earlier that are key uh, for indeed an effective and transparent functioning of the public media sector. Transparent and fair procedure for the designation of the management is key. Uh, a strong also self-regulatory body of journalists is strong, is, is, is a key element. Uh, fair and decent working condition for the journalist is, is a key element. Uh, and, and I'm talking not only of employed journalists by the PSM, and, but for journalists in general, for self-employed journalists, is, this, is, this is a key element. Um, well-funded and independent media regulators, <laughs> of course, is a key element because uh, in the end, uh, we are the ones, we are not only the ones who must guarantee that everybody does his job, we are also the ones that should guarantee and have to guarantee the external and internal pluralism of the media. And that's a key role for regulators, not often mentioned, but I we see and I see it as, as a key as a key element for uh, a free and independent public service media. So uh, we have mentioned uh, it was mentioned in the introductory video that there is a question of culture as well that is very strong uh, uh, because in some countries uh, where there is more self-regulation you have strong and independent public service media whereas in other countries, we have a, you have a more centralized role and more regulation, which will guarantee this independence. So there, there is also a cultural question. And we must not forget that in a lot of countries, uh, and I will include Belgium, to be fair, you know, some 50 or 60 years ago, there was a, there was a direct telephone link between the ministry and the interior and the editor in chief. So <laughs> it's not that long ago. This, Time is, of course, forgone, and hopefully so, but we still have to work on it. And the severe pressure on the financial means of public service media is also, uh, and th there comes the link with the first panel, uh, we, is also a concern for regulators. And now, with the initiative of the MFA, the European Media Freedom Act of Vice President Jourova, uh, we are ready to play a role there, and we are very much uh, in line with the objective of the new of the new regulation. The fact that there is the need for regulation is in itself concerning, but let us welcome this initiative by the European Commission, and uh, we will. Sh we are in the process actually of uh, issuing a, a position paper uh for the during the consultation so it's a bit it's a bit early for me to to, to tell you what's inside it because uh i've got to have regards for the the, the opinion of my colleagues but a lot of things that have, have been mentioned in the first debate in this debate a lot of things that renat uh, stressed are really our concern for an efficient and uh let us say independent uh, public service uh media uh, um, uh broadcasters. Well, it's always a matter of money as well, I understand, not only for the public service media to do their job, but also for the institutions to perform their tasks, which are equally Indeed. important. Indeed. So, but should the money come, then, well, uh, you'll have to uh, keep the ball uh, running. So uh, that will be indeed very interesting to follow uh, the, the consultation and the, the position that the regulators will will express in this regard. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more. Um, I see the chat box is very hot. So uh, after uh, we uh, have completed the first round, please start already to take a look because I will pick up uh, some questions there. But before we do that, we have still uh, Milan uh, from the uh, Bulgarian National Radio with us and I would like to take the opportunity to check with you Milan this issue of culture and theory and practice because I, I, I think really we have touched upon a key element here. We can have wonderful rules and they don't work and we can have soft law which works because there is a will. That is a bit my feeling here. How is your experience? How does it look like uh, from your perspective? The screen is yours Milan. Thank you, Maya. Uh, yes, uh, framing this discussion with the duality between theory and practice is uh, really nice because we very often see a difference between the good intentions and what comes out at the end. Uh, 
Uh, I realize that uh, some uh, Eastern European countries are burdened with an authoritarian past, so the democratic traditions here are not as long or as strong as in many countries in Western Europe, so we still have some catching up to do. And that is why it's very important uh, to look not only at the law, but also at the practice, at the legal practice. So when there are cases, uh, for example, related to the independence of journalists, uh, uh, they should uh, um, really be uh, in the public's eye as to how the, the um, uh, administrative bodies or the judiciary bodies react in those cases, because building up a good practice uh, that safeguards independent journalism would be very useful to us in the future. Uh, and this is why I believe that um, it is very important when we talk about the guarantees, the legal guarantees for independent journalism to also take a look at the guarantees for the independence of the regulator, because only a strong and independent regulator can help the whole media sector develop and keep its freedom. Uh, and we should also take a very close look at the guarantees for the uh, independent courts and judiciary authorities, because they are uh, the ones that will, in the end, make a decision when there is an argument regarding such a sensitive issue. Uh, which is why those, those guarantees for independence should really go hand in hand. I think uh, there is an agreement on uh, on this on this aspect. So uh, was, uh, it's uh, it's indeed uh, a variety of models we have, a different cultural experience, different histories, and the fact that there is no harmonisation in this field, of course, also has led the legislations to develop uh, in different directions. Uh, of course, there are the standards of the Council of Europe. Now there will be uh, a new a new piece of uh, legislative framework, but many. Many, many interrogations. For example, um, Karim, I, I will turn back to you immediately since uh, Milan mentioned regulators and there is also a question to you which is very concrete, picking up also on what Renate said. The, P, the MPM report and the 12 countries at risk, it looks like even, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the ones above any suspicion also have uh, some kind of trouble. And the question says that the Commission is projected Media Freedom Act appears to be looking to ERGA to help with improving this situation. How do you intend to cope with this challenge? Well, I know you, you cannot uh, express any position, but should you be the one who could design the system, speaking just personally from your experience, is it really possible at central level to do something that so far has been dealt with always only at national level? For me, it's, it's really a jump. What do you think? Uh, if, if I want to be in line with what I think and what, and what we've been discussing, uh, there can only uh, be one opinion. So I'm, I'm sure I'm, 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 I will certainly not share my own opinion like that because uh, <laughs> that would be a stretch. Uh, uh, no. The thing is, uh, I guess, you know, the European Media Freedom Act, because that's what we are talking about, uh, should set up a minimal set of rules of high standard, if I may say so. And with, with a lot of good examples in a lot of countries where systems work, and I think that we've got to, to draw from, the, from this experience and from the studies that are being published now, on what works and what doesn't work. And I think that from experience, we can learn a lot and that we can actually uh, improve the model. But uh, I wanted to, to, to add something to one of my earlier intervention, uh, uh, referring also to what Renate said. There is, uh, now we've got to have a stricter rule when we talk about the online world as well. Because, as we've been uh, seen, there are a lot of uh, journalists that are threatened online. And we have got to, uh, in the Media Freedom Act, also take care of this, uh, of this problem and allow regulators or judicial authorities, and this is also a link with the Digital Service Act, to uh, take action when journalists are threatened online. Because this is the first step, you know, of journalist independence. This is the first step of editorial independence that journalists cannot be threatened by when they are doing their job. So uh, this is the, the, the this is a chain. This is a chain. You cannot have independent uh, public service media if 
journalists are threatened in their private life on their private Twitter account or on their Facebook account. It doesn't work. Uh, so we've got to have uh, also a system that will uh, be taking care of that. And there is a, a clear link with the to be drawn uh, between the European Media Freedom Act that is that will be published in the coming weeks and the Digital uh, Service Act. There are indeed different uh, legislative initiatives that are running in parallel and they touch upon uh, similar issues. Uh, I will give uh, Renate the chance to uh, react on that, but then I would also maybe ask Patrick if she, he can share some views with regard to the experience of the platform on safety of journalists on which uh, the Council is doing a great work and also address this other question which is linked a bit to what you mentioned, uh, Patrick, as to the principles on accountability. There is an interesting question here about is there any attempt to develop more harmonized standards for accountability of public service media or social transparency? In some EU member states, PSM are not editorial independent. Moreover, there is lack of effective accountability mechanisms. So I think you really put your finger on, on what is uh, perceived as important. But first, Renate and then Patrick. Yes, thank you. Well, very shortly, I completely agree with Karim. And I actually, I forgot to say that we think the AGA should have an increased role. No, I'm kidding. But of course, we need the, the media authorities also to protect journalists, to protect them also once on online harassment, but also when it comes to access to information, because also that is closely related. But I don't have more, much more to say because actually Karim said it all. <laughs> Very good. Isn't it nice when, when the message is shared? Then it can come also from other people. That's, that's wonderful. Patrick, now it's your turn. You should unmute. Maybe first, uh, maybe first on, on, on the platform. Obviously, the creation of the platform has been an enormous step forward so that all our uh, partners, uh, independent partners, um, journalist associations, but broader than that, media freedom associations, uh, could bring in, alert governments to what is going on, what is going wrong. And getting the, these um, alerts on a daily basis, I can tell you, it gives a sheds uh, a dire picture of what is going on in Europe today, uh, with a number of journalists harassed, threatened with violence, uh, their families threatened, being killed. Uh, this is the reality that we face today. On top of it, very often uh, we get the situation that political uh, representatives also shed a negative light on the work of journalists. And this is something that we really want to tackle in the coming months, because this is becoming a very um, dangerous situation. On top of it, I think we cannot um, live in a void we know that what is happening in europe today and unfortunately the media environment is very much subject to the political developments in which we are living and that we have to take into account and that is going to um, in the future even be more important when it comes to beata's uh, question which is extremely interesting and of course the council of europe has done uh, given a number of recommendations and is working and has uh, developed a further recommendation on the sustainable future of public service media, which is basically um, a draft recommendation that is the recommendation that is for the Committee of Ministers right now on the principle for media and communication governance. And all of that uh, that Beata refers to is available within this draft recommendation which we hope will be adopted very soon by the Committee of Ministers. But there's a number of relevant documents already existing. That is, for example, the recommendation of 96, already 1996, on the guarantee of the independence of public service broadcasting. Um, I will not name them all, but uh, the independence of the functions of regulatory authorities, the remit of public service media in information society, the funding, the public service media governance, all of those are already listed in uh, um, the existing recommendations. You can say this is soft law, but not only, because also the European Court of Human Rights very often, in many cases, refers back to those standards in order to 
implement uh, and guide member states in which direction they need to be going. Absolutely. Uh, the, and thanks for recalling all the good work of the Council of Europe. I think more than ever, it's, it's important to take a look also at these texts. I mean, 96 seems like uh, really a uh, no, geological era ago with regard to technological developments, but these principles are, are, still, uh, are still all valid. Um, there are some interesting references to audiences, competition, private operators and, and, uh, and funding. And I would like to uh, turn back to Olaf uh, Nyhus on this, because in, in Norway there is a bit this duality as well. We have the traditional uh, NRK, and then there are also some public service functions that are carried out by private uh, by private broadcaster. And there is a question here: How do you deal with PSM that are dependent on government for funding, and how to t ensure independence? How can they build audiences against competition from private operators? Indeed, you are fighting for the same eyeballs uh, and. Uh, how how is this working with regard to independence is this possible to maintain the audience still be interesting and i think especially of the younger generations who are maybe not so uh, keen on on using traditional media anymore but is that still possible today and uh, uh, how uh, how does it look like in in norway olaf the screen is yours you should unmute yourself oh am i <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Okay, thank you, Maya. Oh, this is really a huge question, I think. But uh, let me try to split it. When it comes to how, uh, well, to put it this way, trust is about independence, but it's also about use. If people don't use you, then how could they have trust in you if they don't use your services? So, if you want to have trust in a public service media or in any uh, institution, you need to reach your audience. You need to be available for the audience. So, there. When I'm returning to the important, important point of the remit, the remit has to be so broad and flexible that you have the possibility to de uh, develop services to make your content available to all the fractions of the society. That is, is the starting point. And what we've seen in Norway is, of course, that we, since we have the flexibility and the possibility to develop our, develop our digital services, we also reach the audience on the new platforms. And if you allow me, because last autumn in November, the Norwegian Media Authority published a broad report on 350 pages about NRK and our services. And one important conclusion, the most important conclusion for us as a public service broadcaster was, and if you allow me a quote, the Norwegian Media Authority finds no reason to impose restriction on the NRK's digital presence. Any such restrictions may reduce the corporation's chance of fulfilling the public service remit and of reaching groups that make no use of NRK's other platforms. So this is crucial. Of course, there are among the, uh, the commercial operators concerns, but in Norway, I think we can say we managed the digital transition. So even the Norwegian publishers and the Norwegian broadcasters has managed to establish a sound business with digital subscriptions and so on. Some of the newspapers in Norway have more digital sus subscriptions today than they ever had in the analog world. So, so it's a possibility to strive for an environment where they both are placed for strong public service media and a sound and healthy uh, commercial market. I think NRK got a big compliment huh, with this report. Uh, it's, it's. Uh, I don't think all countries get uh, get this said from the media regulator that no restrictions should be imposed. So congratulations. I think that's uh, that's a great achievement. Um, I would like to now close this panel, uh, changing country, going back to you, Milan, because I, uh, there is a question that makes me, which is not, is not related to to Bulgaria but to the Netherlands, but ask for a parallel. It says here that in the Netherlands the budget is in 
since 2000 regulated by the state budget and therefore every year subject of political debate. Over the past 20 years, our experience with this model was not always very positive. Should this issue be regulated on EU level to secure independence? This is another uh, hot potato here. So who pays and uh, how is the political discussion? Is it a good idea to have the money coming directly from the state budget? How does it uh, look like from your perspective and what's the experience in Bulgaria on this, Milan? The screen is yours. Thank you. Well, to be honest, I don't think the main issue is whether the money comes directly from the budget or from, uh, from another source, but rather uh, is the funding mechanism uh, developed in such a way as to make it predictable and sustainable and not subject uh, to uh, ad hoc changes every year. Uh, because this uh, makes very difficult for the public media to operate. So I don't think that funding from the state budget is bad per se, uh, because on the other hand, it uh, it gives uh, some form of stability, because uh, uh, if you have any sorts of funds, they could potentially, um, that could potentially lead to underfunding, whereas the state budget always has enough money, of course, if they decide to allocate it for the public service media. Uh, so that's where uh, uh, the importance comes of a mechanism to ensure that uh, that the funding is sustainable. So there should be uh, an, an objective procedure that guarantees uh, the amount of money that is allocated to public service media. Ideally, uh, it should be dependent on the services that the public uh, media is obliged to, to perform. So we should have a mechanism where first you determine the services, uh, possibly in the law or in the license uh, that we have uh, for, our, for our programs and other activities. And then uh, we should evaluate how much those services cost and uh, uh, the budget should be based on this evaluation. This would, uh, would make it possible for the public media to perform its duties in the way that uh, they are uh, allocated by the state through the, via the, the legislation. Sounds very reasonable. I mean, uh, predictability and sustainability are two important keywords that you that you mentioned. So uh, thanks for that, Milen. I think it's now time to uh, move on and or uh, I would say move forward to the future and take a look at uh, future challenges that are linked to the online environment. We have already touched a little bit about it, but uh, um, for this, uh, we have another little video presentation to show um, our senior legal analyst of the observatory Sophie Vallée will uh, give us some food for thought for the third panel which is now starting so the video can go enjoy good morning everyone and welcome to panel 3 in the digital context public service media is more important than ever to meet the democratic social and cultural needs of society where an unlimited supply of information in all forms and from all kinds of sources can lead to a more divided and polarized community the council of europe has recognized that to fulfill its role in the digital media age psm must be accessible to all on all platforms and in all forms to fulfill their public mission, PSM must have the necessary means, as we have seen in panel one, but also the legitimacy to adapt and respond to new technologies and delivery methods. Otherwise, there is not reaching and serving audiences in global multimedia markets. It also means facing new challenges for PSM, some of which relate to their online remits and how to remain relevant in the digital media age. Other challenges have become more pronounced in recent years, linked to the current political climate in many European countries, which threatens the independence of PSM and takes on different dimension online. The measures of exception taken in times of COVID-19 pandemic have also accentuated this trend, in some cases even calling into question the legitimacy of public service media. If we look more closely at the first of these challenges, namely how PSM can fulfill their online mission and remain relevant for future generations, two main questions arise. 
First, what should be the online remit of PSM and how should it be assessed so that PSM remain fit for purpose in the digital age? How should this remit be defined? Is a definition necessary or even possible? And if so, what type of content should be included in it so that public service media remains attractive to younger audiences and future generations? This also raises the question of the means of distribution of PSM content, as the old distinction between linear and on-demand becomes less relevant online. But it is not enough to make sure that a range of quality programs are made and available. They must also be easy to find, watched and enjoyed by viewers. This leads us to the second question that must be raised, which is how to ensure that the public has access and can find PSM content in the ocean of information that is available online. Today, PSM is increasingly involved in algorithmic recommendation systems. On the one hand, they rely, as any other content, on social network intermediaries that use AI to distribute their content online. On the other hand, a growing number of PSM organizations are developing their own recommendation system, as well as interactive services and personalization. In doing so, PSM face a number of challenges linked to the transparency in algorithmic decision making that may question their legitimacy and one of their core value, which is their editorial independence. On a more political level, Democratic principles such as the separation of powers, constitutional rights and democracy itself are under pressure in many European countries. This gradual erosion of democratic foundations poses new challenges to the governance and independence of PSM and calls into question their legitimacy. In effect, an increasing number of threats to the physical and online safety of journalists over the last years have undermined PSM's structure and editorial independence. Several alerts have been reported concerning journalists intimidated, assaulted, arrested and even murdered. In addition, new types of threats have come from the online environment, including online harassment and threats, especially against female journalists, hateful comments, or a collection of private data for the purpose of surveillance by the state. In addition to this, the current crisis related to the COVID-19 pandemic has led some states to take some restrictive measures and laws that may have an impact on the independence of public service media. These concerns, for example, cuts in budget, suspensions of contract, but also legal measures to prevent false news, which, however, may be disproportionate and have long-term implications for the independence of public service media. So these are some of the challenges that face public service media in the online context. There may be others, but now it is time for the experts to tell us more about it. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you very fruitful discussions. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, we are ready to start with uh, still, uh, I see 301 attendees. That's, uh, that's good, still, uh, still with us. Thanks for following. And uh, we will now hear more about the online challenges. I would like to uh, uh, keep the order. So uh, Patrick, you first again. Um, we have talked about trust. We have talked about sources, uh, public service media to remain reliable. Now, looking at the future and this initiative now coming from the European Union, how can the two institutions share the job uh, without stepping on each other's feet? And uh, what can be a way forward? It will be extremely interesting, I think, in the months to come. Patrick, the floor well, is yours. Well, well, first, Maya, let me already, it's not a revelation, but uh, tell you that uh, we work very closely with, of course, the European Commission services. And uh, I've had the privilege uh, in this past two years, despite the, the, the pandemic, uh, to have regular meetings with Commissioner uh, Jourova um, 
on these issues uh, directly. Um, so that is important that uh, the Commission duly takes into account the standards that have already been elaborated by the Council of Europe. I think that's important. Um, and, and we continue to do so in, in many different fields, but particularly also on the future of public service media. Now, um, Sophie asked so many questions at the same time that it would be impossible to reply to all of them because they're all very interesting, but all of them um, require a, a lengthy response. But maybe one first thing on COVID, and that is important that um, she mentioned that at the end, the Secretary General uh, of the Council of Europe, when responding to the COVID situation, issued a number of uh, recommendations to the member states. Uh, that was primarily uh, following the request of a number of member states to suspend some of the articles of the European Convention of Human Rights. And the Secretary General responded to that with a uh, document, a policy paper which was followed by a specific policy paper on the media situation. And we will provide it to you in the uh, chat, certainly. Now, um, the reality is also, let's face it, the reality in Europe, when not only speaking about the European Union, but larger than that, the larger the pan-European situation is, of course, very diverse. Um, the situation in the Nordic countries can certainly not be compared to what is happening, for example, in the Balkan region, Southeast Europe region or Eastern Europe. And let's face that, that's a reality. In a number of the countries, the tradition of a independent public service media is very recent. It's only in its beginning stage. And the independence of state authorities is something which is um, uh, still to be fought for. And when looking to the future, we should not uh, um, disregard the developments in those countries. That is the first uh, thing. Of course, the digital transformation of the media requires the public service media to adapt. The transition from state to public service media and from broadcasting uh, to digital content delivery requires rethinking and reconstructing public service media, their governance systems to increase the public service media's ability to address the contemporary challenges, but also an innovative and quality public service media. Um, I mean, Sophie announced it, audiences have embraced non-linear uh, video on demand, audiovisual services of commercial providers, very often using uh, a series of algorithms. I think the role of the public service media in this respect should be an ethical use of those algorithms. And that's a quite important issue. And this, of course, gives the viewer uh, a sense of control of what they watch. Public service media need to provide more innovative services and quality content, which necessarily requires adequate conditions human and financial resources in the first place. But as <coughs> Christoph also said in, in the chat, this is not such an easy thing to do when you look at the cultural, financial, political uh, backgrounds in many of the member states of the Council of Europe. So let's not uh, put the uh, benchmark too high because we will lose quite a number of our public service media and ourselves from the realities that they are living. And that is, uh, I think, important. Look for the future, but let's not forget about the realities in many of our member states. In this respect, we are in the Council of Europe again, the Committee of Ministers is making a recommendation for a sustainable future of public service media, which for example, includes uh, adapt, uh, adaption to on-demand services, personalized recommendations of, to the audience, and on third-party uh, third online platforms. So these are the issues I would like to raise. Thank you. 
Thank you, Patrick. So uh, basically, realistic uh, goals, milestones, but with a baseline that doesn't leave anybody out. And then, of course, if there is a will, there is a way, you know, is a, is a well-known quote. So, Renate, now I turn to you. How do you see this issue of the political will to make things work? Uh, how important is it? Uh, it? It has been mentioned many times from different uh, perspectives. We have heard about money, we have heard about uh, trust and, and belief, but then there is this uh, little detail, the will. What's your view on this, Renate? Um, thank you, Maya. First of all, I would like to say yeah, I completely agree to whatever all Patrick said, and we all know that we face very different scenarios. We have here colleagues from Norway and Bulgaria, and I think that shows. But the important thing is that it's not getting worse, that it's getting slowly better. Um, to be honest, the will was a little bit more a subject I referred to in the first part when we talked about the independence. Of course, the political will is also important when it comes to the future. It always is important. But I would like to give you a little, a few example scenarios of what we believe is so important for the future, for the role of public service media in this, um, in, in this very fragile ecosystem where we do face, on the one hand, market failure of journalism, where we have um, online platforms who are still working to buy disinformation going viral with echo chambers, increasing polarization, to name just a few challenges. And I think within this scenario, independent public service media and not public service broadcasting, I learned that from the EBU, and I think it's very important to say so, has a crucial role in indeed keeping societies coherent, in informing, in offering also entertainment in ever more divergent societies and insisting, and that's also very important, in media literacy, in fact-checking and in children channels. Because if we don't get the children, then um, I think our future is gone. I know in Germany at the moment, the whole big discussion is if they keep Kika, which is a very good children's um, channel on linear TV, and um, I hope they will. Um, so yes, it is important to embrace the online media, including social media for public service media, and to reach out to the young, as was said already, to reach out to the audiences that are not dealing with traditional media anymore. So it's important for public service media to invest, for example, in state-of-the-art apps and to enhance their presence online, to, to do innovation as its best, to adopt to changing media consumptions. Indeed, as it was said by Sophie, to remain relevant, diversity, pluralism, regional reporting, changing journalism with more audience engagement, and all this within the global context of online platforms who work beyond national borders is very important. And I think there is a lot of great practice from the EBU there. Um, we already talked about the public service remit. I think this is important um, to keep a redefined clear public service remits as also for the legal certainty of all programs and for justifying and guaranteeing funding. What I also think and just wanted to stress, it was said already, is the co-productions. And I think co-productions are very important when it comes to the local level because we face many news deserts there. We have great examples, again, from Norway, but also from the UK and the Netherlands, and they are important. Uh, last but not least, Quality journalism innovation indeed costs money. It's been said also by Karim, merging newsrooms, new technical tools, training, including training on safety is expensive. Journalists work more and more on all platforms. They not only suffer increasing workload, often burnouts, but, and as we said it before, online harassment is on the rise and they have to be helped. So yes, governments must guarantee sustainable funding for PSM, ideally, I believe, collected via license fee, so it remains accountable to citizens and not parliamentarians, and the audience should be regarded as citizens, I think, more than as consumers. Thank you, Maya. 
Thank you, Renate. And that's uh, indeed uh, lots of food for thought. And uh, co-productions, they have been mentioned. And indeed, public service broadcasters, they are uh, working a lot together. Uh, well, before giving the floor to, to Richard Burnley to, uh, to hear a bit about uh, EBU's position on, uh, on these different topics and uh, what could be the way forward, I just wanted to ask Olaf if uh, you could tell something about this Nordic uh, model of the cooperation that is, uh, has been put in. I see that you received plenty of positive comments in the, in the chat and uh, also noticing that it was very interesting to bring in two so different uh, experiences together. So uh, anything, uh, any receipt advice for baking a good cake for public service media on your end, uh, Olaf? Your microphone should be turned on. Oh, there we are. Yes, there you go. thank you. And if you allow me just personally to say that, uh, I do not manage to follow the chat too detailed at the same time as I follow all the interesting speakers. So, for those of you who have questions for me, please feel free to send me an email and I'll try to answer it as best as I can if you are still interested after this conference. Even so, better, we are going to download all these questions and if you agree, we can dispatch them as well so that you, you won't lose anything. Uh, this is valuable materials, lots of interesting uh, debate is going on there. Excellent, and, and please take contact. Then, secondly, I think that the, the experience we have in the Nordics is that, you know, there are, there are quite equal uh, cultures here, and we manage to cooperate because uh, we, uh, what we do is we secure the, uh, the copyrights for our productions to be exchanged on um, all our own productions, then what we did recently was to agree how do we put funds into cooperation and co-production of dramas as well. So we get, give each other a first right to share the drama, uh, yeah, to invest in the same drama uh, productions. So, so it's, uh, it's still a road to go. And I think just to say that, you know, there are still things to be done when it comes to children program, I think we could uh, develop further collaboration even among the Nordics. That's a personal comment. And, and, and this comes even right when you were saying this, there was a comment coming in into the chat mentioning information and PSM towards children. So I think you, uh, you got it there <laughs> indeed also yes. with our audience. If you allow me just very brief, because it was about governance. I haven't answered all the questions about governance, but I think it's important to distinguish between trust and being trustworthy. What we have seen across the Atlantic, that people do trust content which is not trustworthy. So what we should do as public service media is, first of all, to be transparent. Sometimes when we produce controversial content, we should, as we try, to explain why we are publishing this. What is the challenge? And being open about it. Sometimes we do mistakes. And when we do make mistakes, we should accept that and apologize and make it clear to the audience that we have been wrong. That's how you create trust from day to day. And having said this, I also support very strongly what has been said by Patrick and Renata. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ola, for this nuance. Indeed, trust and, and being trustworthy is, is not the same. Uh, and also thanks for having highlighted the cooperation because it leads me naturally to uh, the European Broadcasting Union, where we have uh, Richard Burnley with us. And uh, cooperation is something you do every day with your members. Uh, at least you, you try to foster them to, to cooperate. So uh, what is your take? Uh, you, you will be the last one here before we now round up. So uh, uh, you are preparing, I guess, to intervene in the consultation that is ongoing. You might not have defined yet the, the statement, but how does the situation look so far from your perspective, Richard? Th thank you so much, Maya, and, and thank you to, to all the speakers for, for very interesting comments. I couldn't agree more with, with, with what's been said today. Um, hopefully two minutes is a bit short to talk about the future of PSM. I hope it's longer than that. Um, but there are some real challenges and we've you know, we've heard today about this, the extreme competition, the, the, the seismic changes that, that are taking place in the, in the European broadcasting markets. We're not afraid of competition. We welcome competition. It makes us better. I think Olaf touched on this. 
um, but at the same time, the, you know, it's a revolution and also the radical changes in viewing habits, which have also been touched upon. I mean, our, our data shows linear over the last, over, over sort of 2017 to 21 period, down from 54% to 38%, non-linear viewing up 46 to 62% in the same period. So th th these are huge changes. And um, I think just to bring it together, yes, we need adequate, stable, independent funding in order to meet those changes and to be online and to, and, and, and to be creative. And we need a remit and a mandate that is flexible, up, up to date and future proof where, where non-linear and VOD, for example, are an integral part of that mandate. And, and this, this is absolutely key to, to, to our future and to our relevance and to our ability to, to fulfill our public interest role. Um, at the same time, um, just, just touch on it, I, you know, I, I would also plead for government regulators, authorities to take the full global competition perspective into account when, when looking at what PSM can and, and shouldn't and, and shouldn't do um, and 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 I think um, finally as you as you asked my in terms of um, very important EU initiatives going on at the moment and we're 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 very excited by by some of, by, by 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 these initiatives and Media Freedom Act being one of them um, to help underpin um, the vital European media ecosystem and we obviously our our, our Considerations and our debates are very early stage, as, as, and, and we're going through the consultation now. We, we we would understand, however, that it would build on the existing audiovisual pillars, um, being single market with with media pluralism and quality European content at its at its very heart. Um, I think we've heard today the vast array and different cultural, legal, constitutional perspectives in different countries, and I think from that we would say. There is no turnkey generic solution um, in regulatory terms. Um, you know, there's also a need to be consistent with primary, secondary regulation. Nevertheless, um, we can see um, a lot of force in a principles-based approach and building on some of the principles that Patrick's discussed today in terms of the European, the, the Council of Europe standards. Um, and so we look we look forward to to to, to working on this together with the um, with the EU, mindful of course of the bigger picture, mindful that governments quickly come and go, um, and um, the bigger, longer term threats to our very core, to our very um, heart, which is potentially the loss of control of of of, of Europe over the media distribution platforms. So I think. All this taken into account, we're optimistic. Um, we, 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 we look forward to working very, very closely on, on these new initiatives and um, towards the EU supporting strong PSM as a, as a lifeblood of, of the European media ecosystem together with the European commercial broadcasting. So, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, time is a tyrant and we are approaching the end, so... Uh been joined by our executive director Susanna Nikolchev for the final part of this event. So uh, I thank you for now and uh, enjoy now the final part. Susanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya. Thank you actually to the panel. You have put us on quite a journey. I mean, we started approximately two hours ago with some economic backgrounds, talked about the legislative framework. We have finally made our way to reality that does not always reflect what we see in writing in a paper. We have looked at models and tools, talked about money, standards, differences, trust. We have also heard about threats and fears, talked about the future, also especially in this regard, and about the hopes. And of course, there is also a context where uh, all this matters and where all of this, I'm sure, will 
pop up again. And uh, one of the goals was to really inform a very particular discussion, namely that on the Media Freedom Act, where we have in parallel the consultations going on. And this leads me to actually wonder, has it worked? Have we informed this discussion? And uh, I know it's a very difficult task to answer to that question, but we have a hero, so to speak, in form of Anna Herold, who is the head of the Audiovisual and Media Policy Unit. And I'm very happy that she has um, agreed to be with us. And I'm curious to hear what you have possibly learned. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, thank you for indeed having me. Apologies uh, from uh, my director, Giuseppe Abamonte, who was originally um, expected to be with us, but unfortunately was taken by other commitments. Um, so what I wanted to certainly say already at the start that the workshop has been certainly very informative. Uh, you have actually already started uh, Susanna um, formulating some main takeaways. Um, so I think we have certainly uh, um, heard a lot that helps us in this difficult internal reflection as to what we could or could not regulate at the EU level as regards independence of public service broadcasting, but also what are the other issues that we have to address in order for our intervention to be actually effective. And that uh, in particular, of course, um, uh, refers, let's say, to the financial sustainability of the entire sector, including public service media and the online challenges that you have also treated today. So I just wanted, you know, uh, with this long introduction to confirm that it did inform our deliberations. So we have listened carefully and, uh, and will certainly uh, uh, go back to the recording um, when we will be thinking ahead uh, on the elements of this new initiative. And, of course, uh, I would also underline how grateful we are for the ongoing collaboration with the observatory and the way you are informing our policies um, uh, in many different areas, including uh, this uh, sensitive area uh, with which we are certainly breaking new ground uh, for the European Union and the Commission, uh, um, uh, as I think it was very clear today. Uh, and this is maybe also a right place um, uh, to say that uh, while, of course, we are waiting uh, impatiently for the, uh, you know, for to study the, 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 the reports that, that, that you have kindly um, uh, decided to produce. Uh, uh, whatever we will be doing, as uh, Patrick has been uh, saying very clearly in the, in the panel discussion, uh, will certainly also be grounded in the excellent work that has been done on this issue by the Council of Europe and will only uh, try to complement it um, uh, with some uh, hopefully enforceable tools uh, that, as they put it, uh, could only make this uh, excellent work um, uh, being enforced much better on the ground. Um, so what I would want to, to, to say, uh, because it was, I think, uh, a bit implicit in the discussions um, that, of course, we are touching extremely sensitive issues, and we do realize that. That was clear already in the introduction by the VP, uh, that what we want to do is to look at best practices and try to um, distill those that indeed might be uh, useful uh, to be enshrined at EU level, and I'm very happy to hear that uh, there has been already quite some support uh, from the speakers and the panels for some of the ideas that we have put on the table. Um, and your work, of course, will help us even better because, of course, you looked at those um, at those best practices that could then serve us as an inspiration for us. Um, but doing this, uh, by doing this, however, we don't want to uh, 
break what works well. That has been also, I think, extremely clear in the vice president's introduction. Um, that whatever we will put on the table will be carefully calibrated and uh, will not uh, um, uh, in any way um, interfere with the well-functioning national systems. Um, but there is one element which I think maybe was a bit less visible in the discussion, but I have seen uh, at least uh, one comment on this in the chat, and I wanted to put it on the table. I think what is extremely new and in a way innovative um, in, in that the European Union starts to look at the rule of law issues, and that includes, you know, the, how should I put it, our highest authority. And I'm here talking about the recent judgments in the context of the, the so-called conditionality of European funds debate. Um, that we are looking at rule of law and, of course, free media, media freedom, independence of media are a crucial part of the rule of law. We see those issues, of course, as the VP said, crucial for the democracies. And this is also the, the, the let's say, the starting point of the Council of Europe's, Europe's work on this. But they are also extremely important for the proper functioning of um, businesses in the internal market. So this has been extremely clear both in the conditionality regulation, and it is innovative, and it has also been confirmed by the recent ruling. So I want to insist a lot, and this is a bit our starting point, uh, that um, um, because of course we have to find our, our angle, as you know, and our angle has always been the internal market, but the help uh, that we are getting is this increased understanding how important those issues rule of law, media freedom as part of it, are for the proper functioning of the market, the actual integrity of the internal media market. So on this, I would like to insist a lot. Uh, and one uh, uh, additional issue that I would like to, to, to mention, because of course this has been part of the debates today, is that uh, in a way, the issues around independence of public service Broadcasters are uh, ex extremely important, but only part of the of a bigger puzzle. I think most of the um, of the colleagues around the table here, virtual table um, or the virtual conference room, um, have seen the, the the questionnaire, the public consultation that we have put on the table. And with that, I think you see that we are trying to tackle the issues from many different angles. We put also quite an emphasis on private interference in the media. So it's not only about state interference. So I think it's important to, to mention. And we also look at the issues of financial sustainability, um, um, what you have discussed today, and also on the online issues. They might not be, of course, uh, um, how should I put it, a separate part of the questionnaire because, you know, they, they, they are mentioned where they are relevant. So on several, uh, in several places, uh, let me just mention, you know, measuring audiences, um, the uh, exposure to media plurality online. Um, so we are looking, of course, at, on, at, on, at online issues as part of the debate uh, around media freedom because otherwise we would be uh, missing, you know, probably the elephant in the room. Uh, and whatever, of course, we will put in the table will be fully complementary with, uh, with the other initiatives that have already been put on the table, like the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, um, uh, that, of course, are extremely relevant in this context. So I think that this, uh, what I wanted to say uh, as a small, you know, modest commentary on the on the today's debate, we are looking forward, as I said, uh, to, to working with the observatory um, on this uh, difficult topic, so your work will really guide us, uh, uh, inform our, our debates. Um, and maybe I will just uh, finish with, uh, with, with something that I wanted to say in the beginning, but then I thought maybe it was a little bit old-fashioned, but Francisco gave me a bit of courage to repeat it. 
uh, I think the very fact that we are dealing with the issue of public service broadcasting, and it is the first, uh, so openly uh, from the perspective of you know, European legislation, um, is, is quite significant and it's in a way a testimony to the attachment that the European institutions have to the so-called dual broadcasting model. Um, and uh, Francisco talked a lot about this duality, so I thought that, you know, I will finish with that. And this should be the key to read to whatever we will put on the table in the upcoming uh, Media Freedom Act. Thank you very much for having me and for organizing this interesting debate today. Thank you very much, Anna, also for supplying us with the wider context, reminding us of other legislative activities that are going on at the European Commission um, level that are very important. I think I would like to for a minute speak as Council of Europe um, staff member and just say, um, do not need to convince us of the importance of the rule of law, the fact that uh, the Council of Europe services and the Commission work so closely together on this very important and still so traditional issue also, I think is very reassuring because it should provide for consistency and for the wide uh, view that you need when you describe your task as defining what you can, what you cannot regulate, what you should possibly not regulate, and all the many other issues and uh, to find out what the best practices are are. So I wish you, I think I wish us all, and I wish also all uh, people who listen to that, who, who have something at stake um, in this discussion, good luck um, with this enterprise. I think it's something really important. I can reassure you the video will be online. It will be online for all of you, as has already been our really today released publication governance and independence of public service media. You can find it on our website and maybe you make it a habit, would be very happy, uh, maybe you have done so already, to follow also what we publish and what we do on the internet because we're really there to serve the, the audiovisual sector at large and I hope we have done so today and uh, definitely we have done so with the help of all the wonderful people who were involved uh, starting with uh, Vera Jurova and her keynote, our great panelists Patrick Penix, Karim Iburki, Renate Schröder, Richard Burnley, Milan Mitev, Olaf Nuhus, and my colleagues, I think you will agree, the two moderators, Maya and Jill, deserve applause, but so do also Sophie Vallée and Francisco Capera. And thanks, um, Anna, for bringing that also back in because there was a lot of work involved, I think, at their end. So thank you to all who have listened to us. And in this sense, stay well and please stay with us. Mm -hmm.